Um, as a church, we have been, we've been working our way through the book of, of Acts and, and the story behind the birth of the church. Um, in the hopes that we might better understand and ultimately to live out the mission and the purpose that Christ has, has established for us from, from the very beginning. Over the next uh, few weeks, we are sort of pressing pause on our series and acts in order to focus on Advent and the celebration of the arrival of Christ. Last week, Pastor Brian began the, the Advent series entitled, God Reached Down. As we look together at the mystery and the power of the incarnation as it's described in John chapter 1. And last week we looked together at the God who took on flesh, who became one of us. As I listened to, to Pastor Brian preach on the incarnation, and if you didn't have the opportunity to hear that sermon last week, um, if you were gone, let me encourage you to go online and to stream that sermon. Um, it's on our website and it outlines the fundamental understanding of Jesus in his fullness is both completely God and, and entirely man. It's really critical in, in our faith as we understand who our Savior is. And as I was listening to, to Brian teach, it occurred to me that we've not really so much pressed pause on, on our series on the book of Acts as we have sort of um, refocused momentarily um, for a few weeks here on that which is most foundational to the church, Jesus Christ. And this is all sort of part and parcel um, together because as we, the church, understand what it is that we're here to do, what we're about, at the center of that is, is Jesus. We have to come back to who he is and what he's done for us. As we enter into this Advent series, I think that there's a, there's a couple words that really describe for me what what this is all about and why we do this. And the first thing that comes to mind for me is the whole idea of, of preparation. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means arrival. This is the, the reason for our preparation, a time to prepare our, our hearts and our minds for the arrival of Christ, for the promised Messiah. Our culture now is in the midst of, of a preparation of a different sort, there's this mad rush to get all the right gifts, to find the perfect Christmas tree, to hang the stockings with care, to bake delicious treats, and the millions of other details that surround us at this time of year. In our cultural celebration of Christmas, but as Christ followers, the preparation is about so much more. It's about God himself pursuing his people with an inexplicable love, to the point where he would take on flesh to reach us. He became one of us in order to reach us. Even as, as a church, as we've been asking ourselves, how, how do we more effectively reach our community? How do we more effectively reach the people that God has placed in our lives? This is, this is instructive to us. The incarnation is, is a model for us, what it looks like to reach. This is the reason for our celebration. This is, this is why we worship. And this is what we prepare our hearts for. The second word that comes to mind for me as I, as I think about this is, I believe Advent is intended to be a, a time of longing. It's really about anticipation. Anticipation of remembering the hope for deliverance that the people of Israel waited for from generation to generation. This is part of what I love about this time of year as we watch children get excited, more and more excited as the day of Christmas gets closer and closer. The anticipation is almost palpable. I remember um, when my middle daughter was just three years old. We had been gone for Thanksgiving, so we got home late and, and came in, and I sort of started dragging some of the Christmas stuff out of the crawl space, and, and I started to and our home, assemble the Christmas tree um, and, and get it ready so that Sherry and the girls could have a nice morning the next morning, decorating, it would be all ready and set for them. And Sherry was kind of getting the kids ready for bed. And my, my middle daughter, she was three years old at the time, walks up from downstairs. And I think I just sort of like turned on one of the strands of lights or something. And as I turn around and I catch her eyes, she's like blowing up with 
excitement and her eyes are sort of bugging out of her head and she can hardly contain herself and all of a sudden she just burst out I'm so excited like just this anticipation I can't wait it's happening Christmas is here this is what I've been waiting for we love that in the life of children we look forward to to seeing there but the anticipation in the life of a child for the impending promise of a toy is just a taste of the hope for something so much greater for something that would become the ultimate gift. So here's the question then that we have to ask ourselves as as we enter into Advent. What is it that that I'm preparing to celebrate? What, What is it that my heart is longing for this time of year? Because I believe that that these questions is exactly what the Gospel of John seeks to provide an answer to as it lays out the beauty and the mystery of the Incarnation. So before we open God's Word this morning, let's begin with prayer. Father, we do thank you for your Word, that it instructs us, that it teaches us, that it shapes us, that it's living and active. Continue just to meet us in this place. Lord, it's in your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Would you turn with me to John chapter 1? We're going to look at verses 1 through 14, and this will be our focus throughout Advent. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came, he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who do receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. As we enter into this text, and before we sort of dig into some of the details here, there are a couple things about, about John's gospel that I want, to, I want to point out, because each of the four gospels, they have sort of a unique perspective that they're trying to draw out on the understanding of Jesus, and you really have to kind of take in all four of the Gospels to build a full view of of who he is. Because Matthew, in the book of Matthew, Jesus is really presented as the promised Messiah and the ultimate king. Um, In the book of Mark, Jesus is really emphasized as as the prophet and, and ultimately as the suffering servant. Luke presents Jesus as the perfect man, the Savior, who came for the salvation of both Jews and Gentiles. But in the Gospel of John, there is a special emphasis placed on the deity of Jesus, on understanding him and presenting him as God. John does this in, in I think, an interesting way. He presents Jesus as God because Matthew and Mark, they're written predominantly to a Jewish audience. That's the reason why the genealogies receive such emphasis in those Gospels. Luke writes to give an orderly account of of the life and the teachings of Jesus. John, however, here, he writes to confront Greek culture with Jesus as the ultimate reality. And he does so by communicating the significance of who Jesus is by referring to him as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word in these verses in the Greek is the word logos, meaning wisdom and reason and purpose, a divine principle. John, in these verses, he's cutting to the very core of of Greek thought, to their understanding of the world in which they lived. Greek philosophers 
looked at the material world that surrounded them and they saw the balance and the order and the harmony that existed and they believed that behind that order and balance was a cosmic spiritual principle that they called the Logos. This is similar to what we might refer to as a worldview, or, or, or more accurately so, the, the, the fundamental assumptions and principles that we would build a worldview on. It, it sometimes helped me to think of it like this. I remember as a child, um, my, my dad saving up for and eventually purchasing our first VCR. Um, if you're under the age of 20, a VCR is like a, it's like a DVD player and a DVR, but with poor picture quality. And... <laughs> And he saved up all this time, finally gets it, brings it home, and, and we're just excited. We're going to be able to watch movies in our own home. I mean, this is like technology that we could not even, you know, dream of at the time. And my dad lifts out of the box this, this enormous manual um, that explains what, what this machine does. It, it essentially provides you with all that this thing is capable of and, and how to operate. My dad spent like the next four hours pouring himself over this manual. We're sitting there as three little kids just wanting to watch a movie. And dad's reading this thing um, page by page. You see this instructions, this manual, is essentially it's giving us the logos of the VCR, the purpose and the reason for it for its existence, how it functions. In order to work it properly, then you had to know and, and operate according to its design. This is essentially the idea of, of the logos in life. So the Greek philosophers at the time, they're asking themselves the question, what if behind all of this, the universe has a logos? And what if life has a logos, a divine, a first principle in which we must align ourselves in order for us to live well, in order for life to make sense? It's in the face now of that question and that concept that a variety of different schools of thought began to emerge in order to provide an answer for what the logos is and ultimately how you align yourself with it. The Stoics built their, their, their logos, their idea around the central principle of acceptance of, of whatever happens. You can't control what life is going to bring you, so the key to life is to accept it, to go with the flow that was at the center of their thought, and they tried to manage their lives around that. The Epicureans placed pleasure at, at the center, and so the key to life was to answer the question, what ultimately brings you the most pleasure, and to pursue that with everything that you have. The skeptics questioned everything. They, they took nothing for granted. Their worldview was built on the idea of, of challenge every assumption. And it's easy now, as we think about this, to lay the same desire to make sense of things into our own culture and our own context. We, we've changed the names or the way that we articulate and live out these governing philosophies, our, our logos, as it were, but the results are the same. We are a people seeking answers for our most foundational questions, ultimately, what gives my life meaning? By, by what standard or system or philosophy do I need to adhere to in order to make sense of all that's happening around me? And it's in the midst of that question that John breaks in and he says, in the beginning was the word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's a, a, a French philosopher um, by the name of Luke Ferry who wrote a book entitled The Brief History of Thought. He comments on this understanding, this idea of Logos, and he says, the Logos for the Greeks was an impersonal, harmonious, divine structure of the cosmos as a whole. It says, but to the shock of the Greeks, the Christians maintained that the Logos, in other words, the cosmic principle, was not the harmonious order of the world, but was a single, unique personality. One outstanding individual, namely Christ. You see, previous to this, at the center of, of both Greek and Eastern philosophies, at the heart of their understanding of what reality was, was an impersonal principle. And to make sense of life, you needed to understand what that principle was and to live according to it. 
John now speaks directly into their understanding of life. And he says there is. There is a logos, a first principle behind it all, a key to the meaning of life. But it's not a philosophy. It's not a worldview. He says it's a person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Ferry goes on to say, by resting its case on a definite human person, the radical concept of love, and the radical concept of love, Christianity has made an incalculable impact on the world of ideas. It is quite clear that without this Christian concept of the human person, the philosophy of human rights to which we subscribe today would have never been established. Essentially, Perry is saying that there is, is nothing like this. It's inter- this is an atheistic French philosopher. But he's saying this changed everything. The Logos that John is describing, this Logos that took on flesh, that entered our world, this Logos is unlike anything the world has ever seen before. He's essentially saying this changes everything. See, John's purpose here is not to change the world of Greek philosophy. I don't don't believe that his intent is to offer us just one more approach to understanding our world, to understanding life, any more than we as the church should view the gospel as just one option among many viable options. John's purpose is is for something greater. He's trying to show us that, that the Logos was not a principle but a purpose and that the key to living life according to our design, according to the manual is to align ourselves with him, to know him and to love him. See, what John is saying is that you don't need to be a philosopher or a scholar or somehow among the elite. The key, according to John chapter 1, is to know Jesus as the ultimate and final logos, the ultimate and final reality. You see, this passage was entirely radical at its time when it was first written, and it remains, I believe, equally radical in our own day. Briefly, then, I I want to point a few observations out that John makes about the Word as he lays it out here in his first chapter. And the first thing that, that sticks out to me is that John says the Word is a person. We discover this in verse 2 and 10, and I'm not going to Um, say additionally a lot on this point because Pastor Brian hit on this last weekend, but I only want to emphasize here again the distinctiveness of this claim by John. This This teaching of personhood is so critical because it's the fact that he is a person that enables us to have a relationship with him. This is what makes John's teaching so unique, to to be able to know, know him and to be known by him. This is vitally important in in the life of our faith. It's one of the primary distinctives of Christianity as a whole. Secondarily, then, John also points out in in verses 1 through 3 that the Word is divine. The Word, the, the Logos, is not merely a way to God. He is not another system or a religion wherein we can make our way to God. No, the Word is God. He came to us. John 1 says that the Word was with God. It connotates relationship. And the Word was God, His deity. This passage in John 1, it points us back to Genesis 1, both starting from the same fundamental place, right? In the beginning, God. This is who He is. John then is not only careful to point out that the Logos is a person with whom we are able to have a relationship with, he goes on then to make sure that we understand that the one that we can have a relationship is none less than God himself. That's who is inviting us into relationship. Thirdly then, John points out that the word is eternal. In verses 1 and 2, he says again here that that this might be redundant with the point that the word is divine, but the phrases was with God and was God are a window into the nature of the Trinity. This is showing us the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the word in closest possible relationship with the Father. Paul would write in his letter to the Colossians, he describes it this way. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. Whether, things, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul describes Jesus in his eternal nature. The Logos was there in eternity past and will be there for eternity to come. John goes on then to describe the word as the source of all life. John 1, verses 4 and verse 9. The word life here in, in verse 4 of, of John 1 is, is a critical word or, or, or concept, really, in the Gospel of John. John uses this word 36 times, referring not only to our creation as, as physical beings, but also to our recreation into spiritual life. Later in, in his Gospel, Jesus says of himself, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. John would, would close out his gospel by describing why he was writing it in the first place. He says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus states it of himself. John defines it as his purpose for his writing. The word is life, both in this life that we live now, but also, and, and I think more importantly, in the eternal life that he has in store for those that would believe on his name as Savior. Lastly, then, we see that John points out that the word is Jesus. The Word is Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. There is so much creative power in the Word of God, and Jesus is that Word. So when John calls Jesus the Word, he means that God has spoken to us. He has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal creator of all things. See, John now is coming back to, to these questions, and, and fundamentally, I believe he's saying that the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. What is the governing a principle that ultimately gives meaning and purpose to our lives, John says it's Jesus. What is the absolute truth whereby all claims of authority must be measured again? According to John, it's Jesus. What is the source of all created things of beauty and of glory and hope? John says it's Jesus. What do we need above all else this season, every season? It's, it's Jesus. This claim that, that John is making here, it's absolutely unique. It's absolutely original. And it changes everything. As I was preparing and, and thinking through this this week, I sat in my office kind of going over my notes on Friday, and, and this doesn't happen on a, on a regular basis. It was early in the morning. Nobody else was in the office. I was sitting in my cubicle reading through this. And just the truth of this just resonated with my heart. And, and again, I don't consider myself like a particularly expressive person. But I just found myself sitting in my office chair with my arms raised in the air. And all I could pray was just, thank you. I Thank you, Jesus. He's it. He, he's the answer. He's what we seek. He's, he's what we need. He's what we're looking for. Ultimately, it's, it's Jesus. And when that reality sort of penetrated those layers of my heart, I was overcome by it because of who he is and what he's done. As we remember, we think about and, and having taken communion, we understand the fullness of this. That what, that what was born in the manger, that what came to us in such humble form, um, would ultimately give it all, would lay it all down at the cross. That's an incredible thing. John says he's the logos. He is the answer. 
John chapter 3, verse 36, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we discover there. We thank you for showing us, revealing to us who you are and how much you love us and, and how far you are willing to pursue us. And Lord, uh, as we take in more of who you are, we pray that we would place you at the center, at the core of our lives, at, at the center of everything that we see around us. I pray that you would continue to do your work to shape us into the men and women that you would have us be, knowing that the answer is, is Jesus. And to your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning and receive the benediction? And before I offer the benediction this morning, I just want to remind you that today as the first of the month, and, and we do this um, Every month, we have the opportunity to give towards the Benevolent Offering. The Benevolent Offering is just our way as a church to support those in our community, both within the church and in our neighborhood, um, who may have need. If you would like to give to that, the ushers are available and back um, for that. And if we can be praying for you, if there's anything that we can be praying for you about or with you about, we invite you to come. We have a prayer team that's available um, and we do uh, consider it a privilege to be praying with you. And then as I conclude, if you would be so kind as to help us stack the chairs, we would uh, appreciate that. And now re receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of the true light, the light who shines in the darkness, so that we may have life and have it to the full. That's his name. Amen.